Good morning. Welcome to the award, uh, award section, uh, section this morning. My name is George Beros from the University of Texas. Um, we're going to have uh, three awards for best paper, early career, and career awards. I would like to thank uh, Siam and the activity group for organizing this event. I uh, also thank uh, the committees that uh, selected uh, the papers and uh, the people that nominated the paper. In that, uh, I would like also to remark that I would like to invite you to uh, nominate uh, your colleagues uh, and uh, papers for the upcoming uh, Parallel Processing 22 paper. The nominations should be in by mid-2021 uh, in order to be considered a little bit earlier. So please do nominate. We have exceptional researchers at all levels and work, uh, and we need to recognize it. Um, the first... Uh, the first award will be on the best paper prize uh, awarded every two years to the authors of the most outstanding paper as determined by the committee in the field of parallel scientific and engineering computing published within the four calendar years preceding the award year. It is my pleasure to announce that uh, this year's uh, award will be uh, to Phil Van Zee, Robert Van der Gein, uh, and several members of the Science of High Performance Computing Group at uh, Auden and uh, Computer Science Departments at the uh, University of Texas of Austin. The collaborators include uh, also uh, Zygmunt Glau and uh, Lee Kilo that are all uh, sitting here. Please uh, come uh, join me in the podium. And several collaborators from uh, University of Madrid, Intel, Cray, Chinese Academy of Science, and IBM. This is an exemplar paper that integrates theory, algorithms, software engineering, uh, performance analysis, both theoretical and experimental, for the Bliss Library for Linear Algebra. This library has been adopted by AMD and numerous uh, research groups across the globe. It is the culmination of uh, de decades of work by our community and, of course, uh, Robert's uh, group. Uh, <clears throat> so please join me in uh, welcoming uh, and congratulating uh, Robert and his group. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, George. Actually, George's name will appear on one of the slides. Uh, he's also one of the collaborators uh, of later work. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. I would like to thank the uh, committee for uh, recognizing our work. We're very humbled by this. And um, we hope that this opportunity to sort of help advertise what we've done will also uh, uh, help the project. Um, I'm actually not the lead author on this paper. The lead author is Field Van Zee. Uh, Field likes traveling so little that I gave him a choice. I said, you either need to apply for a PhD program and get your PhD finally, or you need to go and present this paper. And he really takes some pride in the fact that he doesn't have a PhD. So he grudgingly accepted applying for a PhD program and then to his dismay was accepted. So now he has to do his PhD. Uh, the good news is we're going to streamline this for him. He can go straight to candidacy. So this won't be quite as painful for him as it is for some other people. But uh, the bliss which is underlies all of this work really is his brainchild. Now, there are an awful lot of co-authors, so I think it would be good to go through them. And this is just, you know, make sure that your picture on LinkedIn is a good one because you never know who grabs and puts it up there. <laughs> so the lead is, is Field Van Zee, who has been working with us for well over a decade. And uh, Tyler Smith at the time was a postdoc then went and did a, sorry, he was a graduate student in our group, went to ETA Zurich and now went into industry. So all of these people have kind of moved through over time. Uh, Brian Mark was a graduate student and then postdoc with us and is now with Indeed. Uh, Zay Manglo was up here on the podium with us. He's now at uh, CMU. Uh, Fran is uh, with the University Complutense de Madrid and he um, did a lot of the work on the ARM architecture for us. Uh, Misha Smelyansky, who was at Intel, is now at Facebook. Um, Zhen Yi, uh, who's one of the primary developers of OpenBlas, 
was with the Chinese Academy of Sciences, visited us, and then went off and started a company. Mike Kistler at IBM, uh, Vernon Austell with IBM. For some reason, IBM took a lot of people. I'm not sure what that says. Uh, John Gollans is a former student of mine, who's now with IBM. Then Lee Killo was here on the podium. And um, how did this get to be that we needed a very large podium had everybody shown up? Uh, so the Bliss is a framework for rapidly instantiating uh, Bliss-like uh, functionality. So, uh, you know, the, uh, sorry, <laughs> Blas-like functionality. Uh, you know, the Blas we've all used or abused over time. And obviously being able to rapidly instantiating that in an open source library that has, that achieves very high performance is important to the community. So when Field put Bliss together, you know, he actually takes a very scientific approach to this. He put it together and then the experiment was, let's get a whole bunch of friends out there to try it out and see how easy it is to port it to different architectures. And that's what this paper is all about. It's all about how, now that we have made it, will they come? And to demonstrate that indeed it was highly, highly portable, we got a whole bunch of people involved and the product of that was this paper that demonstrated that indeed it was highly, highly portable among uh, more traditional CPUs. So uh, that's, that's where the co-authors came from. Now there are other acknowledgements because there are actually people within our group who at the time contributed and also since have contributed. There are also people who really should have been co-author on this paper like Jeff Hammond. Where are you, Jeff? For some reason, he fell off the edge. Um, sorry, Jeff. Um, we've received a lot of funding from NSF over the years. And then, uh, you know, here I'm putting up the companies that have supported Bliss in particular uh, over the years. So let's start with a little bit of background. Obviously, this audience knows the Blas very well, but it's still good to just kind of review. Um, this is what it's all about. I sometimes joke that people are going to think that my career was about looking at three loops and an inner statement. Um, and you know, it turns out that it's remarkably tricky to get really good performance. Uh, in particular, you know, if you go and you take those triple nested loops and you just kind of throw the compiler at it, you get performance. And if you then graph it, you may think you did just fine. But if you then compare it to a high performance implementation, or rather if you first compare it to the peak of the processor, you find out that the compilers aren't quite what they should be. And by the way, I should mention, we're using the GCC compiler. This graph would not have been nearly as dramatic had we used Intel's compiler, obviously. And then if you go and you call high performance implementation, then all of a sudden you realize, wait, the peak can actually be almost attained and therefore uh, there must be some magic happening underneath. Now, to avoid having everybody optimize everything on every platform, there is this long tradition in our community to cast computation in terms of the level one, level two, and level three blas. And the level one blas, you know, go back all the way to the 1970s. And then when cache-based architectures came along, the level three blas and casting computation in terms of matrix matrix multiply became extremely important. And you know, over time, this interface has become the building block how you know that we use to build our software. And because everybody does, we've been able to put great pressure on the vendors to highly optimize these. And indeed, over time, the various vendors had their black box implementations of this. Cray had its CSML library, IBM, ESSL, Intel, MKL. AMD used to have ACML, but they actually have switched to using our Bliss library now. <laughs> and on the right is a, is a picture of the kind of performance that you get when you hand optimize. So what do we have here? We have Kolesky factorization on, uh, I think it was on four cores where along the x uh, axis we have the size of the matrix, along the y axis is the rate at which we compute the gigaflops. Uh, higher is better. 
And if you, in the Goto blast, call Kazushige Goto's hand optimized Koleski factorization, you get that top black line. And if you cast the computation in terms of the blas, then you can get almost to the same performance. And usually we're willing to live with that little degradation for the sake of portability. So this is all really important to portability. Now, there have been open source efforts. It was recognized that it was extremely important to be able to have software that was uh, freely available, but also that we could open up to look inside to see what's going on. And a, a key insight was what I think Charlie Van Loan dubbed the poor man's blas. I still remember the first time he gave a talk on this. And the idea was simply, look, if we can get people to optimize only matrix matrix multiply, then we can optimize the other level three blas, and therefore, uh, somewhat cheaply, we can actually attain almost the same performance as if you hand coded everything, right? And that was a really important insight that then uh, was incorporated in various projects. Uh, the other projects I'm just going to shout out are the, uh, the feedback project at Berkeley, which I always found fascinating, one of the very first auto generation projects. And then uh, Atlas obviously was very influential uh, throughout, uh, well, since its inception around 1998, uh, because it gave people really the first uh, widely portable open source uh, library. And the interesting thing here is that the poor man's blas paper was actually published in 1998, as were some of these other papers. But if you go back, the ideas were actually first published in technical reports very early on in the late 1980s and early 1990s. So somehow it seems like these kind of papers sometimes take a long time to actually uh, appear in print. And that was true for uh, a paper about Goto's algorithm as well. So what happened? Around 2002, I get this phone call from a guy in, uh, in uh, Japan who wanted to come work with me on matrix multiplication. And that person turned out to be Kazushige Goto, who when he appeared on the scene, instantly, increase the speed of light from say around you know 85 to 90 percent to well above that. Everybody's performance on architectures went up by 10 percent. And uh, here is a graph from the original technical report which was published in 2002 and there he outperformed MKL substantially which those of you who have sort of dabbled in this area know is extremely hard to do. Uh, the paper the, itself was delayed by about six years from coming in, um, you know, being, uh, print, uh, coming in print. And by then MKL had caught up. So maybe they delayed things. Actually, that's not at all what happened. What they did is they licensed Gotoblas and then all of a sudden they actually matched and slightly uh, exceeded the Gotoblas. But this was a really, really important insight and what he brought to the table we'll talk about uh, in a moment because that's a very important ingredient of what makes Bliss tick as well. So let's move on to our open source solution that underlies the paper that um, received the prize. So Bliss, is an attempt to really create truly an open source code in the sense that people can actually look inside, see what's going on, understand what's going on, extend what's going on. And um, this was first published in 2015, although by now Bliss is about 10 years old. And it really is a refactoring of Goto's algorithm or Goto Blas, one might say. So, I mean, the bliss is much more than just matrix matrix multiplication. We always just illustrate the ideas behind such libraries by focusing on matrix matrix multiply. So, what Field did was he really looked at what Goto did, uh, understood what was going on, and then made it so that what needed to be ported to different architectures came down to the absolute minimal uh, little kernel underneath. 
And that kernel now can be implemented in you know, roughly a couple hundred lines of assembly code and all of a sudden not just matrix matrix multiply comes alive but all of the level three blasts come alive. And how does that work? Um, well, this is a schematic for the Goto, for Goto's algorithm for doing matrix matrix multiply. And on the little card that we handed out uh, that we left on a lot of the seats, uh, you will find this in case you can't quite see it on the screen, although that little pocket guide is rather small as well, so you still may need a magnifying glass. Uh, but this is what's going on. Okay. Achieving high performance in matrix matrix multiplication is all about blocking for the caches. And also it's all about packing for data locality. If you get those two things right, then you have the opportunity to achieve extremely high performance. And how does that work? Well, at the top level, you partition matrices B and C into very large column blocks. And the reason for that really has to do with limiting how much data needs to be moved into the L3 cache and retained in the L3 cache as opposed to anything else. In the next loop, you then express matrix matrix multiplication as a sequence of rank K updates. So now you partition A by columns and B by rows. And at this point, things start happening. It's recognized that this panel of B that you're working on currently in the current rank K update is reused many, many times and that therefore it is beneficial to pack it for data locality. So you do a rather funny kind of pack that is sort of kind of like a transpose but a little bit more. And then you partition your matrix A and your matrix C. Um, and I should say that that purple, the packed buffer of B these days generally tends to be kept in the L3 cache. And then you partition your column panel of A into blocks, and the idea is that that too gets reused for, much, for a lot of computation. After all, it's going to multiply that panel of B, and therefore it becomes worthwhile to pack it as well. Okay, so now you have a block of A, which is sized to exist in the L2 cache, a panel of B that's sized to exist in the L3 cache, and then you move on and you partition some more and you look at every block times little sliver of B, and finally it comes down to bringing in a small micro tile, is what we call it, into registers of C, and then performing like a block outer product with little slivers from A and B, where in performing that block outer product, you really orchestrate that as a sequence of rank one updates. And the reason for that is that you can use most of your registers for that micro tile of C, and then you bring these little uh, columns and rows of A and B in, and you get lots of reuse out of using that data, while a little micro tile of C stays in the registers as long as possible. And that's, that's all there's to it. Um, now, what's special about what, Kazushi, sorry, what's special about what Field did is that he made it so that only that micro kernel at the bottom needs to be highly optimized and typically assembly coded. Everything else can be coded in C, including the packing routines. And as a result, taking this to new architectures requires someone to only understand how to implement that microkernel and then do it. Okay? And that's where this paper uh, came in. Okay? We field had created this infrastructure, and now we needed some victims to go and write us microkernels. So we reached out to our friends out there and various other people who we could convince to do this. And between all of our collaborators and uh, the people uh, at UT itself, this was then very quickly ported to various Intel, AMD, IBM, ARM, Sun, and TI architectures. The TI DSP processor is perhaps the most interesting because it's a slight deviation from a traditional CPU. And essentially in a, you know, a couple of weeks these people went and they optimized 
and achieved very high performance and thus demonstrated that indeed this was a very portable way. And I should mention that once you actually optimize that microkernel, it's not only matrix multiplication that comes online, but actually all of the level three blahs all of a sudden achieve extremely high performance. So now how is this different from what Kazushige did in the Goto blast. Now, realize Goto has gone on. He first came here to work for Microsoft and then he went on to Intel and is now with the MKL group. So who knows what Kazushige does now? But what he did back then and what is still supported within the open blas is an infrastructure where the microkernel plus the two loops around it are all assembly coded. And what that means is that you need many of those kernels because as you try to implement regular matrix matrix multiply versus triangular matrix matrix multiply versus other ones, there's actually magic that must happen within that kernel itself and therefore must happen within assembly code. By casting everything in terms of the microkernel, all of the rest of it can happen in C and does not need to be changed as you port it from one architecture to another. So that's what's, what we demonstrated through this paper uh, that brings us all together here. Now, at that point, Bliss can support all level three blasts. So you, you know, we all know that matrix matrix multiply is more than just the usual matrix matrix multiply. You may have to transpose A, transpose B, transpose both. There's a lot of functionality there. And the fact is that the way Goto had implemented that all the details can be hidden in how you pack the various pieces of A and B. So there, his inner kernel could also be reused across all of these different cases. It's when you get to all of the other level three blasts that it gets more complex. And you know, what these graphs are meant to illustrate, you know, in all of our graphs among the, along the x-axis, we have the problem size along the y-axis, the uh, gigaflops attain the rate of computation, and then typically our top line is the peak that can be attained. So this is, you know, it's easier to translate into this into what efficiency we are achieving. And what you notice is that for DGEM we do very well, although perhaps not quite as well as MKL on this particular architecture, which is uh, the Skylake Extra, that's a server uh, version of the Skylake processor. And you know, MKL is the gold standard, okay? Let, let's all realize that. We give something up for flexibility, but the interesting thing is at least at the moment in time when these uh, performance measurements were made, for other level three blas, bliss is extraordinarily uh, competitive. It's the black line that is bliss, it's always the, uh, the blue one. In this case, it's the blue line that's MKL, and you notice that sometimes we outperform them. Now the instant someone like Kazushige sees this, he goes and fixes it. So who knows what this picture looks like now. But, you know, we can at least claim that everybody gains because we push MKL farther, right? We don't even need to write software as long as we put up graphs that pretends to get this kind of performance. <laughs> anyway, so um, now this is on the AMD Epic where MKL doesn't perform quite as well. Apparently they don't want to optimize for AMD quite as well. There are actually parameters you can set that make MKL do much better. But out of the box, unless you know some secret parameters to set, this is what you get. And what you notice that is that here MKL does much worse while Bliss does very, very well. Um, now, why is restructuring Bliss so convenient? Well, the second contribution of this paper that brought us all together was the fact that by exposing more loops in C, it became much easier to attain scalable high performance. Now that we've gone from multi-core to many core, it's actually within multiple of these levels that you need to get parallelism, and by exposing them, you can play with this. Now here's an interesting uh, part of the experiment of, of the paper itself. Um, here's a picture of very early performance on the Xeon Phi. Okay, this is a processor that required 240 threads to attain high performance. 
At the time that we started looking at the Xeon Phi with our friends at Intel, um, Bliss had not yet been parallelized. We only had single core Bliss. Okay? With help from some friends, we sprinkled in some open bla uh, sorry, some open MP directives. Obviously tuned the microkernel. And in three weeks, we went from single core bliss only to 240 thread parallelism, attaining 80% of peak, matching what MKL at that time was getting. MKL has improved a little bit since. But again, this is a demonstration of the power of abstraction and uh, exposing as much parallelism as possible within the framework. Um, there are all kinds of other benefits that come from this, and I can't go into these very deeply, but one of Field's innovations is how to cast uh, complex matrix multiplication in terms of real matrix matrix multiplication without separating the matrices. What he does is he very cleverly packs it in such a way that the packed buffers are such that the net result is the same as if you did a complex matrix matrix multiplication. And that is all enabled by exposing it this way because it exposes the packing conveniently and then you can uh, pull this trick, which then again benefits all level three blahs. Um, another thing of exposing this uh, structure very carefully is that you can analyze what block sizes to pick. Okay, this is one of the contributions that uh, Zemeng has made since this paper was published. And so there's no auto-tuning necessary. You analyze, you understand. There's a science behind how to pick the blocks. You analyze it, you use it. You may have to fine-tune a little bit by hand and you get extremely high performance. And you know, understanding is important. It also allows us to go beyond the blasts. Okay, the blasts have been around for a long time. They have served us very well. But there's so much more that we've learned since those interfaces were standardized. For example, we can have alternative interfaces. Bliss supports the traditional Fortran, Fortran interface and then the CBLAS interface. But it was recognized that that was a little bit limiting. And, and the way in which it might be limit, uh, limiting, I'll, I'll illustrate in a second. So we have something that Field calls the Bliss Typed API, which is, you know, sort of kind of looks like the traditional API, but it exposes a couple of extra parameters. In, uh, in particular, it allows you to have arbitrary row and column stride uh, in your uh, data. And the real interface that we believe everybody should be using is the Bliss Object Based API. But more importantly yet, we're not trying to impose any API on you. You can go to find your own API on top of the Bliss framework and have whatever API you think is right. So we don't want to constrain you at all. Let's focus a little bit on this row and column stride. Um, so here we have a matrix and we all know that you can store this as a column major, well with column major storage. And then some people might say, yeah, but maybe we want to do this with row major storage. And then you make the observation that, well, if the matrices appear as slices, say, within a tensor, then you may have a row stride and a column stride. And that's obviously the most general. Now imagine the headache of having to accommodate all of that in assembly code, all of these different cases. However, since we're packing anyway, we can kind of gather these pieces together and off you go. You pay a little bit of performance penalty, but the fact is a lot of people right now do that packing themselves before they even call the blast, so at least we shortcut all of that. Here's another thing that we have been able to do. Think of how complex it is to say, well, you should be able to have one precision for A, another precision for B, a third precision for C and do your computation in a fourth precision. And then do that for all possible combinations for every possible BLAS operation that's out there. Okay. This is millions of co possibilities, of combinations that you have to support. So what would you do? Well, you say, well, which ones are important? Well, then you have to analyze which one is important. 
It turns out that by cleverly packing at just the right moment, we can accommodate all of that at almost no performance penalty and manage all of that complexity within the Bliss framework. So you can have complex and real mixed in in your parameters and you can have different precisions. And the obvious question then becomes, can we do half precision? Can we do extended precision? And Field is working on that right now instead of giving this talk. So soon we'll have mixed precision even with um, data types that maybe haven't even been invented yet. Now, it's not just within the Bliss framework that innovation is happening. It's actually also that people have studied what we do within the Bliss framework and have extended beyond that. Let me give a couple of examples of that because it really goes to how this paper has had influence after it was published. So a collaborator of ours, Devin uh, Matthews, uh, works in computational chemistry. He wants to do tensor contractions. What do people do who do tensor contractions? They recognize that a tensor, if you unfold it in just the right way, then the tensor contraction just becomes a matrix matrix multiply. So they do that unfolding, they call the level three blas operations, and then they put it back to where it should be. This complicates their code, it complicates their interfaces, it complicates everything. So the simple insight that Devon had was, hey look, we can always gather everything from where it lives in the tensors within these packing routines. And then we can use this exact same picture to implement tensor contraction without requiring this rearrangement to be happen explicitly. It can all happen implicitly within the matrix multiply operation itself. Okay. Um, there are operations in machine learning like the k-nearest neighbor problem, which actually, this is a paper that George co-authored with some students of, of mine and his own students. And the idea there is often you do a matrix matrix multiplication which generates a very large intermediate matrix, and then you massage that data, for example, by doing a sort in the case of the k-nearest neighbor problem. And there are two problems. You end up with a very large intermediate problem and you end up with the problem that you have to go back and forth to memory multiple times. If you recognize that you can simply incorporate the operations that are the post-process after the matrix matrix multiply into this infrastructure itself, then you avoid those headaches and you achieve much better performance. Now, this is a lot of graphs. Uh, the important thing is blue is what uh, George and his uh, colleagues did, and uh, red is if you do it the straightforward way in which people would do it, otherwise leveraging the blocks. And this was a, a paper in supercomputing uh, 15. Here's another interesting one. Strassen's algorithm. Would it be nice if we could make matrix multiply faster by using Strassen's algorithm? Well, everybody thinks that only works for really large matrices. And we need these intermediate matrices because you end up having to take linear combinations of blocks of the matrices of A. We have to have new interfaces because you have to have workspace for that intermediate stuff. Well, it turns out that all of these different operations can be cast in a Blas-like operation that combines the taking of the linear combination with a matrix matrix multiply. And when you do that, you can then guess what you could do about that. You can incorporate the adding of the matrices into packing, right? Come on, shout it out. All right? So, as a result, you can actually do one or two levels of Strassen and achieve, in effect, a better than theoretical peak if you cheat and use the old operation count. And you can already attain an improved performance for very small matrices. Okay, so there's all kinds of ideas behind Strassen that people say it only works for large matrices. No, it can work for small matrices. It can work for ill-shaped matrices. It doesn't require extra workspace. It parallelizes just fine. It doesn't need a new interface. Okay, we've made it work on GPUs, so clearly you can get scalable parallelism out of this. And if you're interested in that, we have a bunch of papers on that. 
Here's another really interesting idea from um, uh, colleagues of ours in Spain, which has to do with, hmm, sometimes you want to fire up BLAS for one part of the computation in, in tandem with doing it on another part of the computation, but then if one finishes, you lose out on all the threads that are happening there. Well, if you had a mechanism by which you can simply take the threads as soon as they become available and then reassign them to the BLAS operation that's still in progress, then you can balance things out much more easily. And it turns out by exposing these layers, you can do that and get some benefit out of that. Turns out that Goto's algorithm has its limits. If the balance between the bandwidth and the performance of uh, floating point operations gets really bad, you have to go to new algorithms. And you can take the Bliss framework and you can massage it and attain that. Um, so, what's the common theme here in a way? Part of the common theme is that we've exposed all of these different layers and therefore we can do so much more, okay? But the other one is, we like to share that with the world, okay? It's of course tempting to say we'll keep it to ourselves and everybody will be so impressed. And I should stand up here and say, you have no idea how difficult this is. And instead, I stand here and I say, you have no idea how simple this is, okay? How simple is it, is it? Well, we created a massive open online course so that everybody can learn what happens underneath. So we have a four week massive open online course, details of which are on the back of this, uh, this handout that's floating around. By the way, we have a huge stack of these, so if you want the whole stack, take it with you. Um, but we have a four week course that focuses just on the insights that you can get from carefully implementing matrix matrix multiplication that takes the learner from that triple nested loop that gets almost no performance and essentially allows them to match the performance of the matrix matrix multiply in bliss. Okay? And this is a great onboarding resource where you can say there's this undergraduate who wants to start working in our group. I want them to understand high performance, so let's give them this experience and tell them to do it before they even get here because it's an online course, it's free. And hopefully then you have you know, a more productive undergraduate or graduate or postdoc when they arrive. Now, we actually have four massive open online courses, each of which exposes a little bit of high performance uh, to the learner. So we have an under, a, a full semester undergraduate course called Linear Algebra Foundations to Frontiers, which is running now for the 10th time on edX. We have a, pro, a course that I actually think is the most important one of all, programming for correctness, that shows the mathematics of deriving programs to be correct so that you have no bugs. Okay, and that, to me, that six week course every software scientist should take. Um, we have our programming for high performance that I just talked about, and then right now we're rolling out a new uh, graduate level linear algebra course that's sort of a traditional numerical linear algebra course that's a full semester course as well, uh, also on edX. It's also part of our online masters uh, at UT. And all of these can be taken for free by auditors and for a nominal fee for those who actually want a uh, a certificate. So to conclude, um, I'm never good at conclusions. You know, let's celebrate the traditional blas. They've served as well. Okay. Nonetheless, it's time to go beyond in multiple ways. One way in which to go beyond is to say, let's open up the interface so that we can go inside. For example, so that we can fuse operations together so that the interface doesn't become a roadblock to high performance. Another way is, as a community, we can define new operations and quickly implement prototype implementations that achieve high performance with this infrastructure. Um, it really pays to understand what's underneath, okay? You can really make huge new contributions by just understanding the interaction between architectures and algorithms. And then, you know, what is bliss? Well, bliss is this rapid 
this framework for rapid instantiation of functionality, but it's also an alternative interface. Uh, it, it has extended BLAS-like functionality. And you know, what we really like about it is that it's a laboratory for innovation. And here, it's not just a laboratory for innovation in, in, this, in its instantiation in software, but it's also a laboratory for innovation in having exposed what the techniques are so that people can go and quickly put their own implementations together because they want to do something slightly differently. All right, thank you for your attention. Questions? Tammy. Can you help us out with sparse computations? Um, well, uh, I, I, I would say yes, because George Burris' group has worked on sparsifying dense matrix operations. And in doing so, he has incorporated these ideas into those methodologies. And therefore, by exposing the techniques, we indirectly have done just that. But more directly in terms of will we come out with sparse blas, highly unlikely. We have too many other things on the plate. Sorry. Uh, that was very interesting. Thanks for the talk. Um, in the future work, of the paper, uh, you guys mentioned GPU. Um, is there anything happening on that, or, or can you tell us okay. about that? So, so the big things that are happening are new innovations for small matrices where you can't afford to pack, and most importantly, it has to do with this mixed precision. Okay, so the fact that we're moving into the B-float 16 regime, that's really where there's a lot of interest, especially uh, in machine learning in that, but it can be leveraged in scientific computing as well. And the interesting thing is we're now funded by Facebook and Oracle, and we receive no funding from any companies interested in scientific computing. And that kind of tells you all where this is all moving. Yeah, so. uh, you mentioned all of these projects that built on the framework, and I wanted to ask about uh, software maintenance. Do these go into the framework, and then who maintains them, or do they stay separate? Um, so. You said or, and therefore I can say yes, right? <laughs> but so th there are sort of main contributions that really field pours into the body, of, I mean, the, the main part of Bliss, and those really have to do now with the mixed precision and all that. Um, there, there are, well, we have an NSF grant pending that would allow a lot of things that extended Bliss to be brought into Bliss. Obviously, if we don't have funding, we can't do that. Uh, but the fact is, so we have field. Field is, if, if you look underneath Bliss, you will find the most beautiful code written in scientific computing. We've, we've had people from companies who have built Blas libraries look at the Bliss code, and they've said it's, it's more professional than any professional code they have created in-house. So the, the core part of Bliss itself, as long as I, retain funding for, for field, or somebody funds field, um, will continue to be extraordinarily well uh, supported. And new functionality is poured in as field has a chance. We actually celebrate the fact that people go and build their own infrastructures that are bliss-like. We don't want to constrain people by the framework. We want them to extend it, and we, we, we want to be out of their way. And indeed, even within my own group, when people do new innovation, they tend to start by building their own little sandbox that is bliss-like, and then they experiment with that, and then you know, some of those ideas do come back into bliss. Thanks. The, uh, the five loops that you described were structured around three levels of cache and registers. Now we have NVRAM, MCDRAM, other things. And uh, are, are your uh, methods you know, going to take advantage of that? Or is there enough memory at the L3 level you know, for, for where these efficiencies really make a difference? And is this all independent of cache policies? Or are there different you know, versions for different, you know, uh, you know, uh, if you, you know, kick stuff out and so forth? Uh, thank you, David. Um, so, 
bliss is not restricted to only having these five loops. So we can go beyond. Uh, the actually slightly more important issue is as the uh, bandwidth to memory gets much, much worse, uh, what my former student Tyler Smith showed both theoretically and in practice is that Goto's algorithm no longer cuts it. You have Goto's algorithm becomes part of a whole family of algorithms from which you then need to choose, which actually require many more loops to actually implement. Bliss itself is not yet moving at the re in that direction because we haven't quite gotten there. But bliss is flexible enough that with mod moderate changes, it, it could accommodate that. And you, know, you have a good point. Now, the other big elephant in the room is, do we do GPUs? And the answer is no. However, the manager of the software group at, at, at uh, NVIDIA makes a point of coming to our annual retreat, even though we don't work on GPUs. So apparently, our ideas are important also to libraries being built for GPUs. And by the way, they also hire my former students, so there must be something to that as well. Yeah, the different caches really are addressed by the multiple loops, right? And, 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 and things get complicated, and every once in a while, Field does have to um, you know, sort of tear things apart and put it back together again, because we don't want to be constrained by what we have done either. Yeah, there's still a lot of work to be done. And that's why it's important to, to expose the ideas, okay? It's not just about the implementation. That's it. I think, uh, <laughs>